like our, our raping of the planet, which is what we're doing now. If you think that you're part of something bigger and this is all you, you're not going to have destroy the ozone la layer. You're not gonna destroy um, uh, the forests. You're not gonna think all the time in your businesses about how you always have to make a profit. Maybe we have enough. Maybe we just have to work out how to sustain what we have instead of constantly having growth. With children, you're not gonna just tell them, get out there and win on the football team. You're gonna teach a more cooperative way of working with other children, that you work in a, you sit in a circle. You don't have to be called upon. You don't have to be humiliated in, in education, you know, in, in your school. Maybe you just quietly go out and learn by observing as native cultures do. And when the child knows it, the child comes back and, and everybody applauds the fact that he has information. Um, you are going to listen to all your intuitive things and not listen to just what the radio says. Um, if you intuitively don't think it's going to rain, don't bring your umbrella. You know, listen to your intu intuition, not the weather report. So you're going to access other forms of information rather than the ones that you see with your five senses and the ones that you're told. You're also not going to listen to what they tell you all the time. Um, and start now, it's going to have some global effects too in the way that we, and it's already starting with things like peace universities and things like that, but other ways of looking at things. And it's also going to grow in tiny groups where small groups can start talking together about other ways of being, that we don't have to just do it this way, where it's dog eat dog, I don't have enough, I want what you have kind of ways of doing. And as I say, Many times when I found myself, I put my cup out and it gets filled. And oftentimes against impossible odds. Ed Mitchell said that to me. I said to him, how did you ever finance the Institute of Noetic Sciences and put four kids through college? And he said, trust the process. He said, I trusted the process. I got my kids through school. Whenever I needed money, it came my way. I just trusted the, pro the process. So I think it's oftentimes not so much a striving, you know, that the true intention isn't really a striving and a forcing, it's a letting go. And it's an acknowledgement of allowing things in. When you talk to all the best healers in my study that I talk about in my book about the AIDS patients, where they had healers all across America, um, and they took a batch of terminal AIDS patients and they each were given um, a, a different patient to pray for for a week. Um, and uh, they traded patients, so it wasn't just one kind of healer. There were about 50 healers. Um, the healers, it, it was demonstrated without a shadow of a doubt that distant healing worked and that these guys, the AIDS patients who were prayed for got better. The AIDS patients who were the control group who were not prayed for uh, got worse. And what all of the healers who were effective were saying is about letting go, about opening yourself up to a greater power coming in, and that just saying, please, may this person be healed. So without trying to sound really corny, it's relearning how to really pray. And I'm not just talking about praying to some the, the white man in the beard who sits on a cloud upstairs. I'm talking about praying to a larger entity, a, a real sense of the divine, and trying to allow that into yourself and allowing yourself to be just part of that flow, almost like a channel for it. And that really is perhaps the ultimate way that we start really understanding how to live the field. Well, I w wanted to ask you this question. This is a perfect lead <clears throat> into it. What, this whole thing about uh, religion and sort of where we're going in consciousness or modern spirituality. What's the, what's the difference between, um, you know, your traditional dyed-in-the-wool religion and sort of the, the, the world <clears throat> that you seem to be uh, uh, columbusing without a compass into? Okay. There isn't, there's, there's different metaphors for, for the same thing, basically. We all, our current idea about religion and 
ancient ideas of religion are part of man's intuitive sense of the divine, intuitive sense of the, the force or the field. Um, we've all had an intuitive sense that there's a larger un unity there. And so really the field, you could call it, you know, the Holy Ghost, or you could call it the field, but it's the same thing. I think our sense of, of, of religion now is the, the, one of the problems with, with organized religions though, is that there is this sense of separateness, that it's, only good to be a Protestant, or that people who are Catholics are the only people who know the way. And I think now our current understanding of, of quantum physics is this understanding of complete unity, and so that we have to derive our spirituality from a sense of unity, and really all working together, rather than, again, this sign of sense, a different kind of separateness, something a separateness with a different label. But I think it is really what, what I looked at was really a science of the miraculous. And it's really understanding that there's scientific proof for those things that we've always intuitively understood but never had proof for it. Now we do. And what um, of the, just sort of, what's the you know, top three on the hit list in your mind of the scientific proof of the miraculous? And not, not <clears throat> going into detail, just kind of like at a, you know, a, a chapter heading, what would they? Because that's a very intriguing okay. thing you say. It's like, oh, really? What? Okay. What? You know, it's for people watching the movie, they're like, well, I fell asleep for the last 10 minutes. I, I need the, I need the, uh, the top three here. Okay. <clears throat> I'm just going to think for a second. Um, you're talking about studies and things like that. Okay. Um, I think the top three, uh, I think the top three scientific, um, no, let me just say this again. Um, I think the top three hit list, is, as far as I'm concerned, in, in, in scientific evidence of the divine is, uh, is one, uh, all of the evidence that thought can affect living systems, and we're talking about thought can affect healing, and the evidence that healers actually have an energy that can be palpably, that's palpable, can be measured, and can, and can affect people. So that we don't need a lot of equipment, we just need our hands, basically, to make people better. I think that's number one. I think two is the idea that our thoughts go, last forever. Our thoughts can affect things backward and forward in time, and all the evidence from, uh, from the REG machines to remote viewing to even prayer. There have been some studies demonstrating retro prayer. You know that you can pray for people, and and that you know you, we might be able to go back and fix what 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 happened and make it better. Um, that maybe there's no beginning and end to things. Maybe we can, maybe there's just a continuum that we can make better and improve on things. And the third is, I think, the power of the group. Um, that there is more and more evidence demonstrating that if one person has power with intention, that with the random event generators are demonstrating that, that all of us are affecting them all the time by our collective thinking. So it really means that we have to all get together and start thinking the same good things at the same time.